Hey everyone, I'm Matt. Welcome to my shop. This is another one of these multi-question Ask Matt Q&A thingamabobbers. Uh, on the last one I did like this, I had the questions that I asked for from all of you. And I still have a bunch of questions that are, I think, pretty good or pretty interesting. I think a lot of people like to hear the answers to. So I'm going to pull from some of the leftover questions from last time. I also have some questions from uh, my patrons over on Patreon. They're going to fill in some of the the quicker, more fun questions as well. So let's get into it. So Jeff asked, do you have any woodworking books you've learned a lot from? And this is not a chance to plug your friends. Hybrid woodworking book. <laughs> so when I first started woodworking around well, 2008, wasn't a whole lot of stuff on the internet. This is the book that kind of started it all for me. I learned pretty much everything I knew in those first few months or projects or that first year or whatever from this book. Uh, this is a lot of basic stuff, a lot of the fundamental, I don't know, woodworking type stuff, the classic 80s, 90s woodworking type of stuff. Um, there's information in the first half, and then there's some projects in the back. And I made, let's see, what did I make? I made a few of the projects. I made this one, the Arts and Crafts bookcase. And for everyone who likes to critique my wobbly sawhorses, you can thank this book as well for those. Now, when I kind of, I don't know, graduated past that, I think I, this is probably the most helpful book I have as far as uh, like solid wood furniture design and building. This book has a lot of like dimensions of things, how pieces of furniture go together. Let's see if I can find that. I have a really good example of a sideboard. So here is the example of that sideboard. And just seeing something like this that just shows you all the joinery just makes it like, oh, that's how that stuff is all joined together. And then there's different options of joinery in there for different things you might want to try. And there's a few of those cases like, you know, here is a chest of drawers. It shows you different ways to do dividers, um, you know, stuff like that. So I thought this was, this is probably the most helpful book as far as overall understanding the structure and the makeup of pieces of furniture. And yes, I will plug Mark's book a little bit. Um, this wasn't around back when I started, so I didn't get to, like, there's a lot of information here. And the problem with these books is they, at least, well, this one at least, the problem with this one is it was developed at a time where hand tools weren't really that thing, weren't really a thing, weren't really that popular. So this didn't really teach me or allow me to understand that hand tools integrated in woodworking is a thing and can be very beneficial. So that's why Mark's book is kind of nice because it outlines all of the you know, woodworking basics and also shows you ways to integrate hand tools into your workflow, which is kind of how I work now anyway. So it's kind of cool. When was the last time I combed my hair? What are you nuts? You don't comb this. You brush this, come on. So Matt asks, when the general rule for drying lumber is one year per inch, how do you dry yours so fast without a kiln? Um, so first off, that rule, one year per inch, is probably the worst thing to plague woodworking. It's not an actual rule. It's more of a guideline or a generalization. It doesn't take into account any of the variables that go into actually drying uh, lumber. Uh, what it does do is give you a sort of worst case scenario um, guideline of when things should be ready to use. And, you know, depending on the drying conditions, that lumber might have been dried before the year was up, but if you go by that rule one year per inch at one year, it's ready to use, but technically it was ready to use a few months before, for instance. So the best analogy I've been able to come up with for drying lumber is if you've ever done a line drying of your laundry. If you've done that, you understand how the environmental variables will play into how fast that laundry dries out there on the line. So on a humid day uh, with no wind, and maybe it's not super sunny or anything, it's not gonna dry that quickly. But if you have a relatively dry day with a good amount of heat and even a breeze coming through, things are gonna dry a lot more quickly. Same laundry, same amount of moisture, it's just gonna dry at a different rate. And kind of going off of that even further, the articles of clothing you're drawing on a line are gonna dry at different rates. So thinner things, uh, you know, t-shirts or something like that compared to a comforter. Comforter takes a lot longer to dry, it's a lot thicker, and it might be or might feel dry on the outside, but on the inside it's still wet. So that's the comparison between maybe a one inch thick stock and two or three inch thick stock. The outside could feel dry and ready to go, but the inside is still pretty wet. 
So by that, how do I dry my so fast without a kiln? I understand the variables that go into drying the lumber. So if I'm drying indoors in the basement, I know that the humidity level in there is something I can control, or I don't have to if it's the winter time. Right now in the house, the humidity is 10%, which is really dry. So moisture will just fly out of the wood. Now I do take precautions against that because I don't want to dry things too quickly in there either. So that's why I control the airflow. Because the air is so dry, to, can, to maintain a constant drying rate, I lower the airflow. Less dry air going over that is the equivalent, equivalent of more moist air going over it, for instance. So if you can control the variables, you can understand how fast you can dry things. And in my case, I try not to dry them too quickly. Yes, you can dry them very fast, but the faster you dry, the more stress you tend to introduce into the lumber. Is the snow gone yet? <laughs> no, this will probably be here for a few more months. <laughs> so Brandon is having a problem with the bearings on bearing guided bits, leaving a groove in his workpiece. So there's a couple of problems with that and you know, not, not seeing an actual picture of what's going on or video, it's gonna be hard to tell, but here's a few things to think about. So on a bearing guided bit, the bearing itself needs to be able to spin freely because as this bit is spinning, the bearing is actually, the outside of the bearing is totally stopped and touching the workpiece. It's not moving at all while this thing is spinning around at 20,000 RPM. This is staying stationary, so it's not turning against your workpiece. It's just rubbing against it. So that bearing needs to be able to spin freely. So if there's any kind of issue with this thing turning, it's gonna cause a problem. So for instance, this bearing here is totally shot I cannot even turn this bearing against this bit. So that could be one of the things that's causing it. Another thing that could be causing it as well is some of these bits have a washer on them between the bit and the bearing. If that washer is not sized correctly, it's too big for this bearing, maybe the bearing got worn down, I don't know. The washer's at a bigger diameter, the washer will create a groove in your workpiece and that could be the groove you're talking about in your question. So I'll check the washer, check the bearings, and then the last thing, um, as you're feeding this thing through your workpiece, you don't really need to push all that hard into the workpiece. You just need to kind of feel and ride the bearing against the workpiece. Pushing excessively into the workpiece could cause it to uh, damage that workpiece as well. Do you ever see yourself doing anything else in life? Uh, at this point, I don't think so. I can't think of anything that would be more fun or more rewarding than what I'm doing now. Um, I wake up every day and well, most days I'm excited about the day, you know, we all have those days, but almost every day I'm excited to get out here, uh, film something, edit something, get something out there to share with all of you. That's where the fulfillment really comes from, just being able to share what I'm passionate about and um, inspire, educate everyone else. It's just, it's just an absolute blessing. Um, I always heard the saying when I was younger that if you do something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And that is, I say it's kind of true, and that's exactly what I found. Not a lot of people get the ability or the opportunity to actually do what they love for a living. So for that reason, I'm counting my blessings and this is the job for me. So Zach asked if I was to make a new workbench, would I remake my Rubo exactly as it is? And if not, what would I make instead or what would I change about it? Well, I definitely like the Rubo a lot. The utility of the vices, the kind of layout of things really works for the type of stuff that I do. Now that being said, the only other bench I've really used is just like a 2x4 laminated top with a couple of face vices on it, which this is a lot better than that. Um, as far as what I would do differently, if anything, overall I wouldn't change a whole lot. One thing I do wish I would have changed was the overhang on this side of the bench. Uh, as you can see on that side, the overhang is a lot longer. That's to facilitate the tail vise. Over here, you know, usually doesn't really matter a whole lot what's going on over here. But this is where I do a lot of my dovetailing, a lot of my chopping. Having a little more uh, of, the, of the bench come out this way a little bit would give me some more room as I sit at the bench. Usually I sit on this side to be able to sit here and have some more room over here on my left side. Uh, just make things a little more convenient. The other thing I would consider doing is making it deeper. The biggest reason why these two slabs are sized to be about 12 inches wide is so you can make this with like a lunchbox planer. You can feed these two slabs through a 12 inch planer no problem. 
Um, I would think I would want to go to maybe like 30 inches. I think that would be a good depth. The problem with this right now is it's only 24 inches deep. A lot of things I make are like 24 inches deep. So when I was making the, the high boy, the lower case is like 23 or 24 inches deep. So in order for me to stand up on the bench, the legs are like right at the edge. So having a little more depth there would be definitely beneficial and give you a little more room just to work. The other thing is if I, did, if I had a bigger shop, I would make this longer. Um, this is like a seven foot and change long. I think going to eight, nine, even 10 feet would be pretty awesome. It would give you a lot more space. Um, to work on things because a lot of times if you're working on a project you might be working on um, Let's say you're further along in the project you have the main assembly and you're working on some sub assembly So having some more room on the bench to kind of move your assemblies around before you do the main assembly would be a lot uh, A lot nicer because a lot of time I'm moving things on and off the bench and as these projects get get bigger They get heavier they get more awkward to move It's more chance of damaging things as you're moving them on and off a bench just so you can work on some other part. So what do I do with all my sawdust? I put it around the yard as ground cover. We have a couple of gardens that kind of uh, come on a perimeter around the yard in kind of an L shape and I just dump them and spread out the sawdust. Uh, this stuff over here is from the high boy and so in the spring I'll spread that out and even it out and I'll need some ground cover for this area and this way I don't have to buy any mulch. So this next one is from Sean over at Worth the Effort. He asks or says I guess now that you've been milling for a while, using what you've milled, collecting monster logs and getting through the pile, has your target prey trees <laughs> changed any? Are you going to be more selective in the future what you go get and mill to keep, or is it still size that matters most? What's my white whale in trees? <laughs> uh, it hasn't changed a whole lot, except that I'm not really looking a whole lot out there right now, uh, especially the last Several months as I was getting through all of the high boy stuff I just didn't have the time to even think about going out and picking up a tree um, During the middle of the work week or at any point because any time I had I had to spend on Doing those videos, so I didn't have a whole lot of time to go grab whatever so I really wasn't watching and even more uh, So now with an impending move in the back of my mind I'm not even like considering oh, like I don't even look at all to see what's out there because bringing it here means I got to cut it and then I got to move it again whenever we decide to finally move. So I'm selective in the sense that I don't want to bring a whole lot of stuff in right now that has to be uh, moved at some you know random time in the future. That being said, my white whale is definitely going to be anything at this point that would max out that mill. So anything over six feet in diameter you know between six and seven feet would be kind of the white whale and that's like a whole thing in itself I guess from a white whale perspective it's pretty big it's a big piece of um, material so I think it'd be very interesting to try and move that get it loaded and all that it'd be definitely uh, a lot of work to mill something that big but I think it'd be quite the fun adventure and that I'm looking forward to doing that someday from William, I'd love to see more milling. I know it's repetitive, but I cannot get enough. I do not get you guys. It is boring. All right, top five hand planes for finessing things. So I really don't think you actually need five hand planes to really do a lot of finesse work if you're doing a lot of your stuff with power tools. And all you want to do is incorporate some hand tools to do that finesse work. For me, the most frequently used planes that I have are a shoulder plane and a number four, I have that guy, and then I also have my bronze, both the same size, both the same plane. But these two planes are used more than any other planes in my work. The shoulder plane is great for cleaning up shoulders of tenons, as well as the cheeks of tenons, and any rabbits or anything we need to get up into an inside corner. This is great for that. I do a lot of joinery with more some tenons where this kind of comes in handy. So this is one of my more frequently gone to planes. A number four is a really good size for just general work, you know, refining edges, bringing down things to make them flush, maybe a little bit of surface prep if you want to do something like that. Um, I don't do any flattening by hand, so I don't really necessarily need a whole lot of planes that are any longer than this. This is generally a good size to get in there and just do any finesse work on any kind of edges or faces or any kind of bevel work you want to clean up, anything like that cleanup work. Uh, finesse work. This is a great size for that. And if you really want to, you can throw a block plane into the mix. 
Um, these are kind of handy to have because you can do things with them one-handed, but anything for the most part you can do with a block plane, you could also do with a number four as long as you put that piece uh, in a vise, for instance, since you can only use this with two hands. So obviously this is going to vary depending on the work that you do, but for the stuff that I do, these are the two planes that are like almost always on the bench and always in use. Uh, of course, I have a lot more planes in my cabinet, um, mostly because I just like them and it's just fun to use. Uh, a lot of them only come out a few times every now and then. They're pretty rare instances where that plane is actually you know, super useful for an operation that I'm doing. But in the end, it's nice to have them and they're fun to use. Family's doing great. The boys are just growing like crazy. It's kind of scary how fast kids grow. Uh, Max had a surgery like almost a year ago and that actually worked out perfectly. He's had no issues since then so that uh, fixed his hydronephrosis totally fine. He's got two working kidneys now which is awesome. So all he has is a small scar on his back and that's it. He's good. Everybody else is happy and healthy. Lindsay's doing well. Everybody else is doing well. I'm doing well. Everybody's good. No complaints. <laughs> So I think that's going to do it for this one. I do have a bunch of questions on that list that I'd still like to answer. So I'll make another video like this and answer some more of those probably in a few weeks or so. And then I'll make a new questions request for another set of Ask Matt things in the future. This was a lot of fun. As always, I enjoyed this format quite a bit. If you have any other questions or comments, feel free to leave me a comment down below. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you as always for watching. And until next time, <laughs> happy woodworking.